evening, friends. It's a privilege to be back here tonight and to be in the service of the Lord. And we certainly enjoyed last night just commenting the message, a little drama. Well, you never enjoyed it any more than I did of trying to rehearse it to you as I see it, the way the Lord did it or they did it in the Bible. And tonight, it's such a a privilege to be back here tonight and see all of you back again. That's mighty nice. I want to say that many times in the meetings that the misunderstood ministry at this time, but it, it certainly seems to be well understood here. And that shows that you've had good teaching. I appreciate that. And now, always watch what he tells you, you see. It, I haven't time tonight to explain it. How? Just watch what it's saying because it isn't me. I don't know. See, it's just, uh, uh, as I would try to say, just a, it's a gift. Like a gear, you just pull yourself in and you don't know it, but you're the one that's doing it. You're the one, it isn't me. And... Those who travel along and then the, along the roads and so forth at home, the visions that come there are not like they are on the platform. The one on the platform, you're doing it yourself. You don't know it, but you are. It's your faith doing it. And uh, the ones at home is the ones that God's are doing it. And this is what you're doing. As I would just briefly brief it to you, when the woman touched the garment of the Lord Jesus. She turned, or he turned and said, Who touched me? And he looked around. And they, the Apostle Peter kind of scolded him for making such a remark. And he said, he perceived that he got weak. Virtue went out from one little woman. And he looked around in the audience till they found her. Told her her blood issue had stopped. Her faith, her faith had did it. Her faith. When I thought about when he raised up Lazarus, how much greater that was to call a man back after being dead for four days was the thing said about him getting weak there. See? That was God doing it. Now in St. John 5, 19, he said, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing first. See, see it was a vision. Not what I hear the Father saying, but what I see the Father doing. See? Now, the Lord had told him, we know the scriptures are not confusing and they're not contradictory. They are the truth. So then he did not do nothing until the Father showed him first by a vision what to do. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. The Father worketh, I worketh hitherto. In other words, it's just acting out of drama, what God told him to do. Now, God must have told him then to leave Lazarus and go away because he's going to die after so many days. They had sinned, but not go because that lovely family sending for him and he went on. And finally, Lazarus, when he died at the hour and so forth, Jesus knew it. And he turned and said, Lazarus is asleep. Well, of course, they didn't understand it. They thought he was taking a rest. Then he told them in their own language, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there but I go waking. Now I watch him at the grave. Father, I thank thee that thou hast already heard me, but I say this for those who stand around. See? Wasn't nothing said about him getting weak. That was God using his gift, showing his son what to do. But when the woman touched him, that was the woman using God's gift or the faith that she had in it. See, that's the difference. See, it's your faith, not mine. Yours. You're the one who does it. It's your faith. It's such a short stay and such a grand bunch of people that I kind of hate to leave. Though tired, but I got to. And I know tonight they got a, a baptismal service and so forth here at the church. Brother Ned Iverson, my friend and brother, is going to take over the service. Uh, now I carry on for a, a while. And I certainly would recommend him, recommend that you come here. And so then, tonight after service, we got let out early enough for that. And I have to go to my motel and get ready and leave 
hours before day in the morning and drive 700 miles in order to get started the next morning at home, 3 or 4 o'clock at home, and in order to be next week at the Cow Palace in Los Angeles, have to drive across with my family. I haven't gotten more days but just traveling, one and two days between the meetings until this coming September. And it's a pretty big order, so you pray for me. And uh, I'm not too big, and if I was as big as your pastor here, I believe I could just go day and night. Now, I ain't telling you to run him day and night, but, uh, but uh, little brother Ned said today when I was talking with him, the pastor said, I wish I could transfer some of my strength to you. Oh, well, it would be good. <laughs> well, he's so big and strong. And I was always little. When I used to work for the public service company. I'd come up the steps and, and the operator at the top, the switchboard, Mrs. Zeehalt, she said, Billy, I can always tell when you're the company. She said, you're the smallest man that works for the public service company and the most noises. <laughs> I said, well, Edith, I have to make a lot of noise let people know I'm around. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> Now, I believe all the brethren has been introduced, I think, all the way along the line. And one little brother that I left off at the other meeting, and that's a little Methodist boy that was a diet in a wool Methodist out of the seminary and, and uh, got a brother that's a very prominent figure in Masbury, Wilmore, Kentucky. And this boy and his family has come out and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, preaching the full gospel. And that's Brother Collins, Wilbur Collins. Or yet, Wilbur. Uh, Wilbur Collins somewhere back in the back. Would you just like to give us a word from there or come up here? I'd like somebody to see a Methodist got the Holy Ghost besides Brother Neville over here. <laughs> I'm here to just say a word for us. And uh, I guess Brother Junior Jackson, he's been introduced, have you, Brother Jackson? Another Methodist died in the wool and uh, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brother Collins, I've known him for a number of years. Sweet, precious Christian. A real man of God. He and his, his wife and family is all under the order of God's order of the Bible. Brother Collins. Thank you, Brother Branham. I'm not going to take much time because I'm here for the same purpose you are to hear the Word of the Lord. But I do want to say that I'm thankful to be one of them. Amen. Amen. You know, that testimony service last night did me a lot of good. <laughs> I just thought when he got those disciples uh, hiding in the bushes, you know, behind the leaves, listening to that conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well, I thought, yeah, I, I used to hide behind the leaves. They were Methodist leaves. Uh, but I came out from there and found that uh, uh, God was precious and whosoever will can receive the promise of God. Would you all to pray for me as I go from place to place. That's very fine. Now, the Methodist people here... Uh, we don't mean that you're not a Christian, see? But you know what the Pentecostal church is? The advanced Methodist church. <laughs> and uh, Jack Schuler, many of you know him, you find Methodist. Jack told me one time, I come to Phoenix, and I was going to Madison Square Garden, he was out in the school auditorium. And I called him up, I said, Jack, I didn't know you were here. He said, Brother Bram, I didn't know you were coming. And uh, he said, I would have got out of the way. I said, I wouldn't have come if I knew you were here. I said, well, Brother Jack, I said, most of the people come to my meeting are Pentecostal. He said, well, you got my group. I said, I thought you were Methodist. He said, well, don't you know what a Methodist is? And I said, no. He said, a, uh, a Methodist, uh, a Pentecost is an Orthodox Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you know, probably many of you know Jack and Old Man Bob and them. They were real Christian people. I was in a, a Lutheran college, Bethany, where I'd been caught on the carpet all night. Just digging me up. This one called me a polished up soothsayer. And then the Lord kind of got at him about it a little bit, you know. And so he called me up to apologize. We went out into a, a basement where they set a nice big dinner. And he said to me, he said, Brother Branham, I just want to ask you some questions. First, I'm sorry. I said what I said in that letter. I said, 
It's all right. I never even thought no more about it. He said, I want you to tell me, what in the world? Are we Luthers in the race? I said, sure. He said, what, what, what have we got? I said, you got the Spirit of God. And um, I said, you know, they for the students who couldn't pay their way through, so they had about a thousand acres there of corn, so they just worked their way through. So they said, I said, a man one time planted a corn crop. And he went out, and the next morning, there's two little leaves sticking up. He said, praise the Lord for my crop of corn. I said, now, Brother Egri, did he have a crop of corn? He said, well, uh, not yet. I said, potentially he did, didn't he? He said, yes. I said, that was you Lutherans. I said, by and by, them two little blades grew up. And that's why it made a tassel. That was the Methodist. They looked back down and said, no more use for you. You're just a leaf. I'm a tassel. And after a while, some of the pollen fell off of there down back into the leaf again. And it brought forth a ear of corn like the original grain that went in the ground. I said, that was a Pentecostal. I said, but see, it's got the original grain. I said, we got a lot of fungus on the ear, but yet there's some grains there too, you know. I said, but then, I said and I said, now, the Pentecostal church is the advanced Luther. <laughs> he saw it. He said, well, Brother Branham, we... We read of it and said we went down and said we seen the Pentecostal jump and shake and kick over the chairs. So what's what's he got? I said the Holy Ghost. He said, well, what makes him do like that? I said they have to let off the steam. See, and um, and I said, he said, do you believe in that? I said, sure. But to see the thing of it is the Pentecostal church, and where the only fault I find with them is they let it out the whistle instead of putting it on the wheel and making it roll. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody says something against you, if that grace of God stand there to love him anyhow, that's what that, that steam work there. See, yeah, man, and, man. Uh, and going out in the street and bringing others in and so forth, let that let the steam work right there. To, I like to hear it blow too, you know. But wait till we get to the crossing, then we can blow it. <laughs> Let's make it roll the way down the track real fast. So, then uh, I've been graciously invited back to be for pastor. And maybe the Lord willing this fall, when I come back, I come up a few more nights this fall. And Brother Big B, I asked him to get that article again that he wrote. Well, I've had everything said about me. You know, I've been called everything from an incarnate son of God to the lowest of the devils. And um, But I think his expression was just, he expressed it from his heart. It wasn't flattery. It was just what he thought. And I, I certainly appreciate that. It just about, about the best article I ever I had them myself, and I had several of them there, but each one come in, can I take this, Brother Brandon, and the first thing I'm out of it, see. So I asked him if he'd try to get me another one of those, because there's a, some more books coming up, and they're, they're going to, I want the article in it, his name. And um, by the way, I think they've got some books out the back, I think they've got Brother Wood and them, and the tapes and so forth, as the, out the back, as you go out. And now we're, I'm soliciting all your prayers. I go across praying for people and then I'm the one that needs prayer. You, maybe you wouldn't hardly understand that, but that's the truth. It's uh, I need it probably worse than all of you. And maybe not in the way of sickness, but in the way of what I've got to need day by day. And each day, there's people sitting right here now looking right at me. And I was on the interview this morning with and so forth and knows that how this takes the Spirit of God to move out in there and find those cracks and corners in life. This is the word we believe that. Amen. And that's the word. But God set in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. And all those things are the perfecting. And now the teachers and the pastors and evangelists, they're the one who brings the word. And the prophets are to comb in those little corners for individuals, you see, and foretell things that's coming and so forth. The apostles are actually missionaries. I believe now, my education is very limited, but the, I think the word apostle means one cent. Is that right? Does a missionary the same thing? One cent. So how they ever desire to be called missionaries instead of apostles, I don't know. But either one of them is all right as Lord, long as the Lord sent. That's fine. Now, I... Um, won't take much of your time for the baptismal service coming right up. I want to read some scripture. And I'm 
hope it don't take me too long. I said last night, give me 30 minutes. And when I was going down the road, I was just trying to come back to myself and swinging from those spheres. And my son said, that's a good 20 minutes, Dad. <laughs> I said, just about an hour and 45. And I said, oh, I wasn't there that long. I couldn't have been. And I looked around for a watch and I said, <clears throat> but you know, it's something about, thank you. <laughs> It's something. Amen. You keep going. All night. They love me. <laughs> they, they love me, and I love them too. I got to meet some of them brothers out there and shake that hand of a real good old Southern heart beating under there. I really like that. But you know, sometimes every minister knows when the Holy Spirit just seems to every word you say just sinking in. Isn't it a wonderful feeling? You just hate to stop, don't you? Yeah. And yet you know you're rude and interrupting the meetings, but you just can't hardly stop. It reminds me, I've got two little girls at home. And they're pretty good girls now, pretty good size. One of them is 16 years old, the other one's 12. One of them is Rebecca, and the other one is Sarah. And Sarah's the little fella. Well, a few years ago, and I was coming in from a meeting, and they're both daddy's girls. Oh, my. You know how I am. A little boy, a little... Mm, talk about a little... He said he's going to be a preacher. I said, honey, you got a lot of reforming to do. If you do. <laughs> and then, so, Joseph. And so, the girls were quite small yet. And they were waiting up till about midnight for me to get in. And I was tired and been driving all two or three days coming in from California. And when I got home, of course, the little girls had got sleepy and done gone to bed. Mother was waiting up. So I laid down to try to sleep and I just couldn't do it. And, you know, shaky and nervous and things from the meeting, the impact. Souls and realizing all that responsibility to holding the purchase of the blood of Christ before you. It's not just an easy thing. Brethren here know what it is. How you, I think every minister should stay by himself a long time before entering the pulpit to come out in the freshness of the Holy Spirit because he's got the purchase. See, I've often thought what I would do with two drops of the literal blood of Jesus... And now here we have before us the purchase of His blood. He gave His blood for you. And we're handling that audience. Oh my, better be real sure. And um, just as reverent as we can be. So I was real nervous as we all know what it is. And I couldn't sleep so I, my wife waited up long so she was sleeping. I got up and went and sat out in the chair out in the living room. About daylight, I was sitting there thinking about the meeting and wondering back what some of the visions was and so forth. And all at once I heard a turnover down there in the girls' room, right down a little hall there at the parsonage. Now look, Becky, she had woke up. Quickly she thought, this is daylight, Daddy must be home. And when she jumped up, she woke up Sarah, her little sister. And Becky is kind of skinny and long-legged. And and so she uh, uh, come running through the room and Sarah, a little short fella, I kind of compared him and thinking of it as a church. You know, it's been a long time here, you know, and got a lot of history behind it. And, and the other one's kind of this little short Pentecostal group, you know, and they kind of haven't been around very long. So they, and Becky come running out real fast and she jumped right to straddle on my a lap and she said, throw her arms around my neck and begin uh, hugging me and you know how your heart feels. Well, little Sarah, she had on, I don't know where your children does, not mine, gets the hand-me-downs a second. So she had on Becky's pajamas, and the feet was like a rabbit feet, you know, way too long, and little fella was stumbling, falling, coming through the house. Finally, she made it, and just about time she got there, Becky looked around and she said, Sarah, my sister, I want to tell you something. I was here first. See? and said I've got all of daddy and there's nothing left for you so little Sarah a little lip dropped down her little brown eyes kind of watered I stuck my other leg out motioned to her she just run and jumped right on like she was a saddle horse and she was kind of tottery you know she was about to fall off she hadn't been around very long her legs was as long as Becky she could reach all the way down to the floor you know and so Sarah was tottering, and I put both arms around her to hold her. She laid her head over on my bosom a little bit. Directly she snapped those little black eyes and looked back to Rebecca and said, Rebecca, my sister, I want to tell you something. It may be true that you've got all of daddy, 
But I want you to know Daddy's got all the meat. <laughs> you know, when he gets all of us wrapped up in him, we just don't care anymore, do we? Everything just fades all the way out. And um, that's what I want to do, and that's what we all want to do. Just let him get all we got, all our time, all our senses, and just give over to him. That's right. Now, let us read some of the precious word now before we talk on it again just for a little bit. And let's turn in the Bible now over in the book of St. Matthews to you who wish to write down the text. And let's begin with the 12th chapter and the 38th verse, down including the 42nd verse. And there were certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after sign. And there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was in three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The man of Nineveh shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold a greater than Jonas this year the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a uh, greater than Solomon is here. If I should call a little word that I like to draw from that, behold, a uh, greater than Solomon is here. He had been rebuking those Pharisees for their their disbelief. They had had the Bible down through the ages, the scrolls. Or all the prophets that spoke of him coming. All the way from Moses, when he wrote Genesis, spoke of the coming Messiah. Moses described him just what he would be. How that and Isaiah described how he would be born, how his birth would be of a virgin. And um, Moses spoke that he would be a prophet, just like him. And all these things had been said about our Lord. And yet, the, the system of that day had just made got away from the Word and had what they were living by, their tradition of the elders. And I hope our churches never get like that, to get away from believing God's Word to traditions of the elders. Then we form dogmas and then put things in the... In the our doctrine that really isn't in the Bible. And I hope we always stay full gospel and preach the whole gospel all the time. All of us. That's um, that's the way I think that God meant it for us to just preach the whole thing. And now, as I've often said, I may not have faith to make every promise come to pass, but I sure wouldn't stand in the way of somebody who did have enough faith to do it. I've often said I'd like to have enough faith like Enoch did that I wouldn't have to die when my time comes, just take an afternoon stroll and go up home with him. But if I haven't got that faith, I am sure hope I get to see somebody that has got it. And I'll trust that someday we'll all have that faith that when he comes we can just take a stroll and go home with him. Now, Jesus had strictly, as we noticed last night in the little drama, that he would strictly performed and did just exactly what the Scripture said He would do. And many of those had believed it because even like the woman at the well, as soon as that a spirit and act uh, flashed upon her heart, she knew quickly that that was the sign of the Messiah. There was uh, the Messiah, when He came, He was to do that manner of work so she said, you must be a prophet. I see sometimes we uh, disregard something that's real good 
because it doesn't have the, the polish on it that we think it ought to have. Uh, I don't want to get away from my text, but here some years ago I was reading where that, that there was a man had done a, a crime and uh, he was been put in prison and tried and was uh, found guilty of something that he had did when he was in the service and it's during the time of Abraham Lincoln and they were going to shoot the man at uh, sunrise on a certain morning. Some good friend that loved him and he pleaded uh, for him and he couldn't get no answer so he went to the highest source that he could. He went to Mr. Lincoln. They said that Mr. Lincoln was getting out of the carriage and he fell down before him and said, Mr. Lincoln, uh, sir, told the case and he said, He's a good man. I think he had run away in time of something, battle or didn't, didn't obey his charge or something. And so, and he said, he was just nervous. He'd come out of a good home and said he was just nervous and tore Mr. Lincoln, he didn't mean to do that. And day after tomorrow morning, they're going to shoot him. Uh, he dies by a firing squad. Day after tomorrow morning. Said, Mr. Lincoln, you are a Christian. Said, you... One signature of yours would pardon that man's life. And said, he didn't mean to do that, I'm sure. Said, I begged for him as a friend. Mr. Lincoln picked up a piece of paper and just wrote on it said, Pardon by Abraham Lincoln. He take it to the man in prison. He would not receive it. He said, you present it. He would not receive it. He said, no, if it was Mr. Lincoln's, it would have to be sealed by a seal in the United States and so forth. And all like that said that how the polish should have to be on it. And because he rejected it, he was killed. Because he rejected that there was Mr. Lincoln C or our name signature, but he rejected it. And then it was tried in court because there was his name said that that he pardoned the man and the man was shot. So when it was tried in federal court, here was the decision of the federal court. A pardon is not a pardon unless it be accepted as a pardon. So that's the way God's Word is. It's the Word of God to all those who will accept it as the Word of God. If it's not, well then it isn't. So we believe the Word and that's the reason we're watching for the sign of His appearing. We don't want to be wrong in that. and We want to, don't want to take somebody's uh, thoughts about it. We want to read it right out of the Word. So Jesus had strictly and straightly performed every sign that he is supposed to be. Now we also know, before we leave the, this part of the subject, that the Jews seek signs. See? Greeks wisdom, and Paul said we preach Christ crucified. Now, the Jews seeking a sign because they, they put the sign above their theology. And it was a good thing if you might say, now that sounds kind of strange, Brother Branham. Well, Jesus said, if I do not the works of my Father then believe me not. See, if he didn't confirm the, the word of God, then don't believe him. But he said, if you can't believe me, then believe the word. Now we notice in the Bible, if a prophesier or a dreamer had a dream and they was uncertain about it, they take them down to the temple and put them before the Urim Thundam. And you notice, if the Urim Thundam didn't answer back. Now the closest study that I can find on that, what that Urim of Thundam was, was this breastplate of Aaron's. I picked it up the other day at one of the conventions up at the American Baptist um, grounds up in Green Lake, Wisconsin, where the full gospel business man's having a convention. And they had the pattern of the stones there all. Now, and they took a dreamer or a prophesier, no matter how well it seemed, if those mysterious lights like rainbow flickering on that Urim Thundam, then the dream wasn't accepted, neither the prophecy. It was tried by the Urim Thundam. So see, it was supernatural that always vindicated truth. Amen. Now, I think the same thing today when we hear so much that the days of miracles has passed and you Pentecostal and full gospel people have gone off on the wrong end. I think it's because they don't understand after that year of thunder of that priest or that uh, age ceased in the Aaronic Levitical priest age, we have another year of thunder, and that's God's Bible. Amen. See, Amen. and if our signs and wonders 
or re- God's Word is reflecting them, then we can say amen to it. It's God vindicating exactly what He promised to do. He promised He'd pour out the Holy Ghost in the last days. So it's just a reflection. It's it's this Urim of Thundam reflecting itself in the people. Amen. I'm sure that's not hard to understand amongst this kind of a people. It's the, the Urim of Thundam here, the Bible, reflecting God's promises. And Jesus had reflected His office as Messiah and they had disbelieved it. And in the following chapters we understand that they, or the, the same chapter previous to this, they had seen his works and they had called him Beelzebub. Beelzebub is a devil. Uh, like uh, they would seen him doing those things and they thought he was a fortune teller or a witch or something. And he told them, now you're speaking against this and I'll forgive you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, perhaps to do the same thing was his meaning, to speak against that would never be forgiven then. See? Because... In, in this world, nor in the world that is to come. Now, now, God in all ages always had gifts in His church. He's always vindicated His people. Wherever you see the living God, you see the signs of a living God. Amen. Now, there was Moab upon the hill, and he was offered, he had seven altars, Balaam did, and he had seven bullocks, he had seven rams, that bullock, a clean sacrifice, ram speaking of the coming just one. Fundamentally, he was just as fundamental as, as Moses was down in the camp of Israel. But the only difference was that God was confirming Moses by a smitten rock and a brass serpent and a pillar of fire and a shout of a camp in the camp of a king in there and God was vindicating that down there. Amen. That's the difference. Amen. That shows now uh, if we talk fundamentalism, now Cain was just as fundamental as Abel was. Both boys was wanting to find favor with God. Cain brought a sacrifice. Cain built an altar. Cain worshipped just as much sincere as Abel was, but Abel by spiritual revelation on which the church is built on spiritual revelation of the will and word of God, offered a sacrifice that God was pleased with. And now, I believe that's the day that we're living in now also. Now, God always had signs. Jesus here was speaking of upbraiding them cities and said, Oh, thou Capernaum, and different ones, if the signs, if the mighty works had been done in you, that... Uh, or was done in Sodom, that been done in you, it will remain till this day. And you're exalted into heaven, but be brought down to hell. How is uh, rebuking the cities that did not receive the message? And look at the message today, how it's crossed the world. Missionaries, oh, I believe it'll be more terrible for Sodom and Gomorrah, and it will be for the peoples and the cities and today that's rejecting the gospel Amen. when God Amen. with his Urim of Thundam, is reflecting his last day signs and wonders among his people. Amen. Just look what's been done in the last few years. Around the world revival fires are going with uh, great signs and wonders and miraculous things. There can't be nothing follow that but judgment after being rejected. Now, Jesus is speaking here of some of the people in the days that God had showed signs. One he spoke of was Jonah. And uh, Jonah was sent down to Nineveh. And I always felt sorry for Jonah because many people, I think, misunderstood Jonah. Now, they said Jonah was backslidden, he was this, that, and the other, and I've said the same. But let's just study Jonah for a minute. I don't believe that he was backslidden because he was God's prophet, and he seemed to be walking out of the will of God. But the little story I want to tell you in a moment, I believe you'll see that God made it all work out just right. You know, the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And that gives us ministers a time 
a chance sometimes to kind of catch our breath when we think we made a wrong move. But sometimes God's just moving with us. We think it's wrong, but maybe it's God moving. Now, Nineveh is a city much larger than this one. Yes, about the size of St. Louis. And it was a, a city of heathens. And it was a great commercial city. And a great uh, a city of the seacoast. One of their main occupations there was fishing. And they were idol worshippers. And their sins had become so great until God just couldn't stand it any longer. Remember, there was no sacrifice on the altar for them then. Like there is for the world today. So God could not intolerate that horrible sin. So he told his prophet to go down to Nineveh. We're all acquainted with the story who reads the Bible. And said, cry out against that city. And the prophet, when he got down to the seacoast, instead of going to uh, Nineveh, he took a ship that was sailing out to Tarsha. Now, we've always thought that was a shortcut or dodging the duty. But I'm going to try to take up for that preacher tonight. And I'm going to say that I believe he was a prophet and was exactly in the will of God. I believe he followed the leading of the Spirit. I believe he was led to go that way. He didn't understand it after God had commissioned him one place. And here he found himself going another way. He went down into the bow of the ship or down the hull and went to sleep. And a great storm rose up. Well, we know that all of them cried out they was going to go into sink and there was something wrong. And Jonah come up and confessed that it could be his fault. He said, bind his feet, his hands, and throw him overboard because it wasn't right for all of them to perish because of him. Now, God uh, had a big fish we call a whale to swallow him. And the fish was feeding through the water in that storm. Many of you notice how fish will surface, especially in the storm, to feed because as much uh, the, the ocean's having a revival. You know, it's jumping up and down, having a big time. That's when it's a, that's a revival. I remember when I stood by the side of the seashore the first time. It wasn't a sea, it was Lake Michigan. I was just a boy preacher went up here. Paul Rader preached at the World's Fair. About 1933, I believe it was, and when it was in Chicago. And I had my first opportunity to walk out and look at the large body of water, larger than the Ohio River. And it was just a jumping and a going on, you know, and it was early spring, Easter, sunrise service, we were there. And I seen those great big white caps coming in, you know, and hit the, the bank and roll out. I thought of that saying floods of joy over my soul like the sea billows roll. I thought, they roll in, but that's not the end of the wave. It goes back to roll in again. Roll in. I thought, oh, what's it jumping about? What's it all? And something just seemed to say to me, it's having a revival. That's all. Well, I thought, you know what? There's not one speck, not one drop more of water in that place now, in that lake, than they was if it was perfectly quiet. There's no more water. Not a bit. Did you ever think of it? But it's just having a revival. Just jumping and screaming and shouting, having a revival. I thought, well, what's the use of having a revival? There was a wind came down, a rushing wind, you know, as we believe it, and begin to stir it up. What's this stirring up part? I happened to see that all the trash was out in the lake. It washed it off on the shore. So that's what a revival is for. To wash all the trash out. You see? Get all the world out. And just rail up on the shore. Now, when uh, we... Uh, I hope our Pentecostal churches don't need one of them. I see. We just have to rejoice by You know, our churches really don't need that. Though. So, uh, <clears throat> we, have a, we have a revival anyhow. <laughs> so then, it... Um, it's just jumping and frolicking out there in the waves. So then uh, as this uh, ship jumping and the uh, fish feeding and uh, first thing you know, a big whale came by and swallowed up Jonah. And I was talking to someone about that year a few years ago when um, they brought a whale to Louisville on a flat car, just a skeleton of it. And this man was made a remark about it. He said, now... Uh, you know you've heard the proverb in the Bible about uh, uh, the whale swallowing Jonah. So now I want you all to notice that it, he couldn't have did it. It'd be as 
Oh, where the esophagus is here said the whale couldn't swallow much more than a like a, a orange or grapefruit where it goes down. Now, I stand there just as a boy listening. You know, I happen to think that you notice I read that later on listening. I thought, surely the Bible wouldn't lie about that. And I, I thought it couldn't be and remain the Bible. And that's no proverb. I believe that's the truth. But did you notice this was a special whale? God prepared this one. This was a special bill for the occasion. You know, God can do that. Yes, he can. He had himself a sacrifice up there one time on the mountain in Genesis 22. Jehovah Jireh could provide for himself a whale. Don't you believe so? So he got one big enough to swallow this prophet. And then when he went down in the actually fed, anyone knows when you feed your goldfish, well, you notice he goes right down to the bottom puts his little swimmers on the bottom and rests because he's got a tummy full. Well, there he is down there resting. And this old whale perhaps swallowed Jonah and went down to the bottom of the sea, maybe many fathoms deep, and was resting. He had a, a whole tummy full. And then, uh, but you know, Jonah down there in the belly of this whale with the seaweeds wrapped around his neck and he was in a bad shape. And uh, he turned over on his back and he is in vomit of the whale, and he began to look this way. You know, people talk about, well, Brother Branham, I was prayed for last night, but my hand's no better. You're, you're not looking to the promise. You're looking at your symptoms. Okay? Well, I, I was sick last night when I was prayed for him no better this morning. Uh, uh, pray for me again. That's all right. But if you accepted it the first time, there's no need to pray anymore because it's already settled. You see, it's yours. No. And um, you, you look at symptoms. It depends on what you're looking at. See? Yeah. So he was looking at symptoms. Uh, down, look, what if he would have looked at him down there? What if he looked this way? It was a whale's belly. Look that way, it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked, it was whale's belly. And he was in the bottom of the sea with his hands and feet tied behind him in the bottom of the sea on a stormy sea. Now, at the bottom of the sea, now you talk about a case of symptoms. He really had it down there in the bottom of that sea in this whale's belly. And... Um, and uh, there he was, his hands tied, his feet tied, laying with the seaweeds and what the fish had eat previous to this wrapped around him and laying down in the bottom of the sea. But you know what? He wouldn't look at that whale's belly. You know what he said? They were lying vanities. Amen. They just wasn't right. He's going to look at something else. He said, once more will I look to your holy temple. Amen. Now, Jonah knew that when Solomon dedicated that temple, that he prayed and said, Lord, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and look towards this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. And he had confidence in that prayer. Amen. And you know what God did? I don't know whether he put an oxygen tank in there or what he did, but he kept him alive for three days and nights. Amen. Now, Jonah could have faith and under those circumstances, on a prayer that a man prayed, an ordinary man that later backslid, and God honored that faith, what ought we to do tonight? Not looking at a, a temple made with hands, but in glory. And not a man that backslid, but the Son of God sitting there with His, with his bloody garments to make intercession upon our confession. How we should not look at our symptoms, but look at God's promise. Yes, sir. Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. That's all. He's a high priest sitting at the right hand of His majesty on high to make intercessions upon our confession. What we have believed and confessed. And anything that He did for us, we can confess it and believe it. And He's there to make it good before the presence of God. How we ought to rejoice and don't look at any symptoms. Look at what God promised. That's the promise. Now, we find out that's strange. Three days and nights, that old whale just circled around and around in the water somewhere out there. And Jonah was alive. Now, we are told that those people were fishermen. For their living, how they made their livelihood was fishing. So maybe all the fishermen out, and one of their gods was the whale god. So all of them out there fishing in the sea, and all at once up raised their god, run right up to the bank and licked out his tongue, and the prophet come walking right out of the mouth of their god. <laughs> how could they kill the friends? Sure. No wonder they put sackcloth on their animals. For the 
The sea god had spit the prophet right out and he told him to repent. Now, you see, Jonah wasn't out of the will of God. He was right in the will of God. And Jesus said that a wicked and adulterous generation will seek after signs. Did you notice that? And they will receive it. He promised that they would receive their sign. He said, as Jonas was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Now, this is a wicked and an adulterous generation. Amen. We know it. And what was the sign they was going to receive? The sign of the resurrection. Amen. Jesus is not dead, but He's raised again. Amen. Again. Great commercial cities given over to the to the enemy, over to the devil, and marrying, given in marriage, and adultery and perversion and all kinds of filth that's in the earth today, and unbelieving Christians, yeah. form of God in this heady, high-minded, intellectual age. Amen. The prophet spoke of it. The Holy Ghost said specifically that in the last days there would come an intellectual age. Amen. Men would be lovers of their own selves, proud, yeah. blasphemers, disobedient, un- in- incontinent, and despisers of those that are good. You say them communists, Brother Ram, no sure they're church members. Amen. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such. So are getting the sign of Jonas. For Jesus Christ is with His people tonight, performing and doing the same thing that He did before. He was crucified. He raised again and is living with us. You, you don't understand who that is you're sitting with out there. That's a son and daughter of God. Maybe it's a good thing we don't understand it the way we do. Oh, while we are assembled in heavenly places, watching His Urim Thummim of this last day, reflecting His presence as He's ready to come, He's making His appearance in the form of the Holy Spirit to hone out His church to get it ready to be received. We're so happy to know. So I don't think that Jonah was out of the will of God. And I believe the wicked and adulterous generation seeks after signs. Now, and they, God never refused, but He always gives them a sign. Now, we find out that we come down to the next character, which was Solomon. Now, all Bible readers know that the days of Solomon was the golden age of Israel. If they prospered more under Solomon because there was hardly any war and they built the temple and it was a great golden time uh, for Israel. And the reason when Solomon, the son of David, when he took the throne, while he never prayed that God would, would uh, give him uh, so much, but just wisdom to know how to govern and, and hold the people together. Well, now God worked with him and he gave him a gift of discernment. Amen. True. Yes, certainly is. Amen. And he could discern the right from the wrong and so forth. And the news scattered everywhere throughout all the world of this great... You know, if God in any age, when He sees the people and He gives them a gift and a sign, and a gift always produces a sign. That's the reason Jesus was rebuking them because He was God's gift And the sign of God's gift was being vindicated. He said, if you can't believe me, believe the works. For they speak of me. And now, wouldn't it be nice tonight if all America believed God's gift? For this last days, the Holy Ghost. Sure is God's gift. Now, just think, if they turn that sign down and that gift, what happened? The, The nation... Went into chaos. If they accepted that gift, then the nation had a golden age. Now, that's the same as it is tonight. Think of every American tonight that professes to be a Christian 
and believe in Jesus Christ would accept and believe the gift that God has sent us in this last days, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Why, you know what? They could take every police off the force. They could just burn down the jails. We wouldn't need them no more. No, no. There'd be no more law offices and things. We wouldn't need it. While the millennium would be on. <laughs> sure. But what are they doing? They are turning down the gift of God. Amen. Not only that, but like it was in the days of Noah, they're making fun of it and scoffing at it. Amen. And we're sitting sweating it out. That's right. Noah had to sweat it out too. Not changing from Solomon now to Noah. But did you notice God, after Noah would give his message, God told him to go in the ark and he sealed him up in there and the next morning he thought it would rain. But you know, Noah went in there on the 17th day of February. But you know what? It never rained for a week. Amen. And the people sitting around there, they said, well, the borderline believers said, that old man could have been right. Let's go up and see if it does come. Some, the sign says there's no water up there. But he said that his God could make water up there if he had promised it. So he might be, let's just hang around the bar. There's just so many of that kind today. Just to see what's going to happen. You see. So they said, if it really does start like some water up there in the skies, clouds or something, we'll knock on the door and come in. Well, the first day Noah believed it was going to rain. So he sat and looked out that window and the sun come up and crossed and not a drop of rain. You know, and Noah began to wonder, wonder if I'm right or wrong. So then the second day passed, the third day passed. Pentecost, don't never get in your mind that you're wrong now. Just sit there and sweat it out. He promised it and he's going to do it. Amen. Amen. Uh, speaking of the night, don't pursue me. What if the apostle said, we've waited here nine days. I believe we've got the Holy Ghost. I presume we've got it. Let's go on and start our ministry. Oh, no. They waited for that Bible sign appeared over there. Yeah. That's still it was yeah. right. Yeah. And they wasn't thinking nothing. They seen God have vindicated when His year of thunder began to flash out in their lives. Then Peter said, this is that which is spoken of with the prophet Joel. Yeah. That's right. Because he had a scripture to back it up. Yeah. And that's God's church today. Yeah. And Solomon was God's great anointed one. How I'd imagine everybody in one heart and one accord. The whole nation was one heart and one accord. Wasn't that the way to be? What if all of the churches called the church of Jesus Christ tonight were just like Israel was at that time? One heart and one accord. They didn't want to come in and say, Oh, well, I don't know about old Solomon. I don't know about that. I believe he's a fanatic. What do you think about it, Jim? Oh, I believe he's a fanatic too. Go out and live under their own olive tree. No, everybody would come to the meeting. They'd say, oh, Pastor Solomon, I've never seen such in my life. Glory to God for sending the Spirit down upon us. And you know, a revival like that gets scattered all over the world. Sure it does. And now in them days, they didn't have television and, uh, and radio and press and so forth to scatter news. It was just from lip to ear. And the great camel caravans and things passing through the different parts of the country... Well, they'd take the news. And after a while, he got way down in Sheba. Way down there. And there was a little queen down there now. She was a heathen. But she would begin to hear someone coming in and saying, Oh, I just passed through Israel. And we picked up some uh, stuff up there and we brought it down here. And, oh, you should see that country, you should see what kind of a meeting they got going on up there. They're just one person. And you know they've got a God up there that they call Jehovah. And that Jehovah has selected himself a man and he's vindicating himself to be Jehovah through that man. Oh my, must have been a great talk. You know, faith cometh by hearing the word of God. See, that's right. So these people are saying that Way down in the heart of this little queen, she began to wonder. Wonder if all that's so. Well, wait till the next camel caravan comes through. And so the next one comes through. Have you passed through Israel? Yes, I've come that way. Is that so? They got a revival up there, the Pentecost, or the, well, the Pentecost of that day, you see. Have they got a real revival? Oh, they're one heart and one accord. Oh, Amen. Right. I just wish this group could get that way tonight. Amen. I tell you, Columbia have headlines in the morning in the paper. I tell you. Yes, yes, wonderful. And said, oh, yes, that. tell me, did you get to see that uh, man that got up there, uh, uh, Solomon? Yes. Is it true that they've got a God that makes himself known to them? Yes, that's right. Boy, that little heart began to beat. <laughs> she wanted to go. Now, I think if we would start 
telling how good our people was. How wonderful this Holy Ghost is. Yes. Instead of trying to run one another down, you see, to each other, I think it'd make every... You're the salt of the earth, you see. But the salt can only save when it contacts, see. So I think if we just get real salty, the world will get real thirsty. Don't you think so? Amen. That's right. Get real salty. And now, we find out that Solomon was just having a great time. And so this little queen began to hunger and thirst. And I just imagine at night time, she would wake up and she would call her, her, her girls and she'd say, Oh, I had a dream. And I dreamed that I, somehow a strange dream. And I believe that maybe it was because that um, leader of that band today was telling me about that revival up in uh, Israel. Finally, her heart began to beat till she said, well, you know, I'm going up to find out for myself. That's good. Amen. Make your choice. You know, when something begins to beat, begin to thirst, it's time to go to hunting, man. Amen. If you begin to think, I may die one of these days, I don't know God. You better get started because that's God's red light. Amen. The signal's coming down. So you better hurry. If something tells you tonight, I believe there's a fountain for healing somewhere. God's signal ringing. Get in right quick. The water's already in trouble. Or you have to step right in. When did you get trouble, Brother Benham? 1900 years ago on Calvary. It trouble. And then on the day of Pentecost, it really shut the whole thing. It really got trouble then. Now, all you have to do is step right into the waters of the Spirit and get healed. Now, this little woman, she was hungry and thirsty to go up there. So now, after all, she was a church member. So she had to go get a consent from her pagan priest. So if she could attend the revival or not. And so I could see her now go down and she said, Holy Father, I uh, would like to ask permission from you. If I could, uh, they're having a revival over in Israel, they tell me. And they got a God over there that, oh, he's living right in the people and they're all one heart. And they tell me that man has got a, a gift of discernment of some kind. He knows the mysteries and can foretell things that's coming to pass. And they say that there's great God up there that they serve. And, you know, uh, uh, Holy Father, I would like to go down there and see if that's right. I could just imagine what's taking place. I can hear him say, my child. <laughs> the dignity of a queen would ask to go amongst a bunch like that. <laughs> you know where God is pouring out His Spirit, they're always looked down upon somehow. Amen. As a bunch of know nothing. Sure, they don't know nothing in this world. They lose their own mind that they might find the mind of Christ. Amen. And so, there, it was certainly bad evil spoke of. I can hear him say, child, certainly not. If there was such a thing going on as, as that kind of a gift, it would be in our church here. Yeah. You know, that still goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Said, Why, sure. Said it would be right here among us and, and our groups. That's where that would be going on. She said, but uh, Father, uh, it's, uh, it isn't so. And they tell me, so I'd just like to get permission from you if I could go up there. Listen, you are a dignitary. You have a lot of prestige, and you are, you're a noted person. You can't belittle yourself to go amongst a bunch like that. <clears throat> and so um, uh, she said, but you know, sir, I, I want to go anyhow. You know, there's something about it. When God goes and tugging at your heart, there isn't hardly anything going to keep you away from it. Amen. That's right. Amen. So begin to tug at her heart, you know, you must go anyhow. Well, she said, I've heard about it. That's how faith comes. Let me just go and find out for myself. I'll come back and bring you reports. You shall never have my consent. While your old dead grandmother and great-grandmother and so forth, this queens before you, they've turned over out there in their tombs if they know you did a thing like that. I can just imagine her with a heart saying, well, you might as well get ready to turn over because I'm going. Because so, why? Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the word. And when God goes to tugging at a heart, there's no way to get rid of it. Only go do what it tells you to do. Yeah. It's the only way to do it. So here she was, tugging at her heart. And going, he said, now look, 
Uh, you just stay here at your church and someday, maybe great Dagon or one of our God Gerald moves, she said, listen here, I want to tell you something. I have lived my time out in this temple and all my days you've talked about a God and I've heard my mother say the same thing and you've got a book of rules here and you've got a, idols hanging around here and I haven't seen one thing take place. Amen. 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 That's and if there is such a thing as a God that can come into you, do you all know the form of pagan worship? I know I don't want to. I'm watching that clock up there. I'm going to get wrong on this one. So now a pagan worship, the way they do, they bring the idol and set it up. And then they get a priest up and they bless the candle and they put this candle before the idol and they bring him something to eat and eat communion with him and then they prostrate themselves before that idol and just give in their mind in such a way till they believe that they can hear that idol speak back to them. Now that's pagan idol worship. Now that's contrary to God. Amen. See, God is not an idol. God is a spirit. Amen. And we prostrate ourselves before that. And the spirit don't come into some idol, as some so-called Christians would have us to believe. But the spirit comes into you. And Amen. you are God's house. Walking around, manifesting the living God. Amen. For God... Dwells not in temples made with hands, but a body has thou prepared. Yeah, yeah. You are God's letter, a written epistle. God is in you, manifesting Himself through. If you could prostrate yourself before God and say, God, I'm a sinner, come into me. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and then you are a living idol of God. Living representative of God. Walking around with God speaking through your lips to others. Yes. Now, this little old woman says perhaps to this priest, said, I've been here all these years. You've talked about all this. I haven't seen one time it spoke. I haven't seen one person that acted any difference. It's always been the same old thing and there's no life in it at all. And if there's somewhere that there is a God that can give life, I want it. Yes. Amen. Amen. I say amen to her. Amen. Yes, sir. I want to find it. Well, first thing that, it costed her her membership. <laughs> so she tucked her membership under her arm. <laughs> so I think maybe she might have walked down the road. Now that little lady had some things to confront her. And now to go up there. And now the first thing she said, I'm going up. And I've read all the books of what this Jehovah should be. And I'm going up to see for myself. And then she loaded down some camels with some gifts. And she said, if it is so, then I'm going to support it. If it isn't so, I'll bring my money back. Amen. Boy, she could teach some of us in America some lessons. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. If there's anything to it, it's worth everything. If it isn't, they were nothing. Get away from it. And she said, if this thing that Jehovah claims to be, if he's manifesting himself and I can see it with my own eyes, then I'm willing to give everything to it. Yeah. But if it isn't, I can just bring my gifts back. Yeah. Now remember, with all that gold and stuff on them camels, she had uh, hundreds of miles to go. And you know what? Esau's children was in the desert and they were robbers. And what an easy prey it would be with all that money. Or just a, a group of those robbers to fall in on that little lady and slay her and them few little guards, eunuchs she had with her and take that money. But you know something? When you are going out to meet Christ and determined to meet Christ, there's no danger you understand at all. Amen. You don't care for nothing else. You've got one objective and one achievement and that is to meet Christ. Or if the world will get the hunger like that. She wanted to meet Christ and that was her main objective or meet uh, Solomon the gift and see if it was God and she didn't know any danger she didn't know somebody said one time I uh, seen a woman uh, got up and started shouting and she ran around honest she hurtled about four chairs and some up and said look like that woman would have 
broke her neck. I know where she's a common little housewife down there. But I said, she wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> she just crossed over and she just couldn't sit down. That was all. She was running. She's on fire. I said, she just had to run. And so she wasn't thinking about the danger. She was going on. I like to say, well, I, if you don't... Uh, if you don't do so and so and so and so, you're going to die. You don't notice that. You take God's word for you and you just keep running on. And she had to go on. And now, remember, if you'll draw on your watch on your mat from where Jerusalem was all the way down to Sheba, that's across the Sahara Desert. And um, it just takes a camel three months to get across there. Now, she didn't go across in an air-conditioned Cadillac, <laughs> see, she had to cross on a camel Amen. and taken three months to do it. Now that's when she's really hungered for God. Amen. The trouble with we Pentecostal people today, we got everything laying right in our lap and we just look at it and say, well, I guess it's all right. Yeah. That's pretty good. But when you have to pay a price like that, you really enjoy it when you get it. That's right. There she was. She just had to cross the Sahara. And here it was. And these old camels perhaps travel at night. A few maids with her and a bunch of little eunuchs along out there, not thinking of nothing else, but all through the day, sitting up on the way somewhere, uh, reading those scrolls, what Jehovah was. Because <laughs> faith cometh by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Amen. She got these scrolls and was reading them. She wanted to know exactly what Jehovah was. And Solomon was manifesting Jehovah. So she went to find out. Well, finally she arrived and she got at the gate. When she got at the gate, she unloaded all of her camels and probably parked out there in the lot. And let's just give a little drama now. I can see the people from everywhere all around. And the next morning, she cleaned up and, and went over to the, the meeting. And she got to sit down. And first thing you know, Pastor Solomon come out. And all the uh, music played and so forth. And Pastor Solomon come out. She got her... She didn't have a prayer card, so she just waited way in back in the building. You know? So she waited back there for a long time and... When Pastor Solomon got to, uh, got to talking, they, she noticed that there was nothing but the wisdom of what she had heard. And the next morning when she came in, I guess she got about middle ways. And the first thing you know, it come to pass that she got right up close. And one morning she got in the line. And she got up before Solomon. She said, now I see how, where this right or not. I'm just, I just, something all over me tells me it's right. And the Bible said there was not any secret but what God let Solomon know about. Amen. That's right. And when Solomon began to talk to her and get, discern her heart and her desires, you know what she said? She stood up before the people. Look at this little heathen now. Stood up before the people and she said, All that I heard is true and more than I heard. Amen. Oh, Amen. she was double convinced. Oh, she had seen like the rest of them had seen and now it was working on her. Amen. Amen. And if you don't believe the Holy Ghost is right, give it the same kind of trial. Amen. You might hear it on others, but wait till it goes to work on you once. <laughs> Then you'll know for sure that it is a gift of God. Amen. It takes all temper, all uh, sin, all unbelief, all doubts, all fears. Even the fear of death goes away from you when the Holy Ghost comes in. Oh, it's real, friends. If you've never received it, don't let the night pass without receiving it. What a, a great thing it was. That poor little lady was so thrilled until she... She stood up there and even wanted to, to take some ground back down with her. She was really become a believer. And Jesus said, The Queen of the South shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Amen. For she come all the way from the utmost parts of the known world of that day, a back of a camel, to hear the wisdom of Solomon and I say unto you that a greater than Solomon is here. Yeah. Yeah. Where Solomon was a deserting, look how much greater that was. And now tonight, after he's been dead, buried, and risen again in the glory as a high priest for 2,000 years, yeah. and the infidelic world, communistic, inspired as it is tonight, in the midst of all of it, a greater than Solomon is yeah. 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 here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
her life. What was the matter with the little lady? She had seen something for one time in her life that was real. Yes. Something that wasn't a put on, a ritual, or a form of something. She had come to a church where she seen the moving of a living God. Yes. Amen. Now, if that little woman will raise in the day uh, Jesus is on the earth with that generation and condemn it, what about today? When she come 2,000, oh no, about 90 days, I don't know how many miles it was, it's way down, I did have it figured up once, but I know it takes a long time to get up there, about, about 90 days to get up there, three months to the desert, to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and here in America we'll hardly drive across the street. To see the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. by a Bible, a Urim of Thundam, that promised that it would reflect Him in the last days, and here it is by Bible evidence. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit with Bible evidence Amen. has come into the church Amen. and showing the signs and powers Amen. of the resurrected Amen. Jesus. The immortal spirit of God is working not just with one. He's working in the entire church, showing signs and wonders, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, speaking with tongues, giving interpretations, pouring down power, converting sinners, always showing signs of his being here, discerning the hearts and thoughts of the people that he promised he would do. And remember... The last sign that Israel got was that, and that's the last sign promised now. Amen. The last day sign. Here we are. That little queen had seen something that was real, something that she could look at herself, and it was real. She could see the reacting of it upon that man. She knew that it was something that people today, I believe. If the church, as I said, wouldn't blow so much steam from the whistle, but would put it to work and hunger and thirst to get the people around where such things are going on. See? They want to see something real. They just don't want to come in and put their name on a book. The people that are hungering and thirsting for God is coming to find something real. I remember not long ago, I might have told you this little thing. As you know, I'm a hunter. Or I just like to hunt. I'm not a hunter. But I hunt in Africa, India, and everywhere around the world. My mother was a half-breed. And she, and my grandfather was a noted hunter. And so I always loved it. The first thing I ever bought, I dropped sweet potato plants all day and got a quarter, bought me two steel traps, and I was in business. And I, I brought me a possum and sold that hide, and I got me some more traps, and I went in real business then. And I was about eight years old. And I've been hunting ever since. Now, I used to go up in the north woods and hunt. Way up north. And I used to hunt with a good hunter up there by the name of Bert Call. He was a real hunter. You didn't have to worry about him. Many times you take fellow woods and you don't watch. If you don't really know directions and how to read signs, moss on trees and so forth, you'll have to look him up for a day or two. You get turned around just right out a little piece. But not Bert. And that flat country up in there around Maine and so forth, he knew just where he was at. We'd go hunting every morning, and he, he never had to worry. If we separated, he, Bert would be there that night. That's all. And um, so we loved to hunt together. There was only one thing against Bert that I had, and that was he was the meanest man I ever seen. He had eyes just like a lizard. Uh, you know, scraped like some of these women got to paint their eyes these ladies. Oh, you know, that funny look at <laughs> Don't look like an ordinary human being. And uh, he had kind of a slanted, lizard-looking eye. And he was mean. And, uh, you know, he used to go out with me hunting. And he would, he would shoot those little fawns just to make me feel bad. And I said, Bert, now it's all right. I ain't nothing against uh, killing a fawn now that you're hunting, brothers, you see. No, sir, if the state says you can have it, all right. Because the conservation watches that to see if they got enough they can let it go like that. And there's nothing wrong in the, the age of the animal. Abraham killed a calf and God eat it. <laughs> that's right. So don't think the use, but just to be mean. That's it. Just to do it to be mean. I think that's just murder. And um, 
I wouldn't kill anything like that. And so uh, Bert would just, he'd see a fawn running, he'd just turn him over like that and say, I'd say, Bert, I love you, you're a good man, but you're, you're the meanest man i ever seen. He said, oh, preacher, that's with all you guys, you're too chicken hard. And he said, get next to it. And uh, I went up there once winter, the hot with him is kind of late in the fall, and there was a uh, kind of snow had already fell, and the hunting season had been out for a couple of weeks. And uh, I, Bert was, went up there to meet me, and we got to the camp, and we got our hot chocolate. We put it in our, a thermos bottle, and then we got out, caught somewhere in the snow, and could, had to stay all night, build up a fire where we'd have hot chocolate to keep us kind of warm through the night. And it, maybe a sandwich or something, and, and always carried dry matches to build a fire. And that morning, we went up over Jefferson Knot, going into the presidential range. And uh, so we went up, not even a track. Them little white-tailed deer, you talk about Houdini of being an escape artist. They're really good. And they can get under that brush, and you, you, you don't see them right late in the evening, just before dark. You see one just move, it's moonlight, you'll wait till the night time to come out. The, and after they're shot anyhow, they're very, very hard to find. And we hadn't even found one track that morning. And it come about noontime, and um, before we left, Bert said, I got something for you, Billy. And I said, what is it? And he reached out his pocket, and he had a little whistle. I said, what's that? Coyote for coyotes? He said, no. So that's a deer call. So listen to this. And he blowed it, and you've heard a, a fawn cry, like a little deer a fawn crying for its mammy. And I said, Bert, you wouldn't do that. <laughs> he said, oh, preacher, let you guys said so you're too chicken-hearted to be hunters. And I said, well, Bert, I like to hunt, and frankly, I've had to get his deer many times. But he said... Uh, he said, uh, but you guys are too chicken-hearted. I said, well, don't, don't shoot them little bitty fellas. Bert, I said, you ought to do that. And he, I said, you wouldn't blow that whistle like that. He said, you just watch. Well, I forgot about it. It was about 11 o'clock in the day, and we come to a place about as big as this room in here, snow on the ground. It's an open place. And old Bert sat down, and he started reaching back like this. I thought he was going to take a drink of his hot chocolate. So he reached back like this, and when he did, he brought this little whistle out. Well, I said, Bert, you wouldn't do that. He said, shh. He took that little whistle and he cried out sound, just exactly like a little, a little a baby fawn crying for its mama. And when he did, just across the opening, a great big doe stood up. Now, that's the mother deer. Those great big ears, big brown eyes, a beautiful animal. And she looked, old Bert stuck his head down below this little bunch of bush. Them lizard eyes looked up at me, you know. And I thought, oh my, it surely won't do that. And he blowed it again. Now, that's unusual that time of day for a deer to raise up, especially in hunting season. And when he blowed it again, she walked right out in that opening. Now, that's very unusual any time for him to do that. But, you know, she was a mother. And down in her heart, she was a mother. She wasn't putting on anything to show off. She was actually a born mother. And a little baby was in trouble. And she didn't fear nothing then. She wanted to find where that baby was. I see them big ears yet just sticking out like that. You know how they do that head up like that. And all at once, I seen Bert. We never put a hull up in a barrel or shell until you see something to shoot at. So he put the shell up and he had a 3006. I seen, oh, he was a dead shot. And I seen him level out like that. And I thought, oh my, he'll blow that loyal heart of hers from to her. See, how could he do that? And that mother trying to find his baby. See? And he blowed it again. And the, the deer recognized when she got a whiff, the hunter was there. But you know, she never jumped. Usually she would. But that baby was crying so pitiful that she didn't care if it meant death. She was going to find that baby in trouble. That's real, genuine motherhood. Amen. There's just nothing will take its place for her. Only God. God said, can a mother forget her suckling babe? Yes, that she may forget her babe, but I'll never forget you, for your names are engraved on the palms of my hand. So I watched that hunter, and he turned around and leveled that gun down, and I know that crosshair was right across her heart, that big 180-grain mushroom bullet. It would blow that loyal heart of that mother plumb through her. And I thought, how can he do it? I couldn't look at it. I just turned my back like this. I, it kind of turned out behind some bushes. I, it said in my heart, Heavenly Father, don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. And I, just to myself, I was just listening any moment, 
to hear that gun fire. And I noticed it didn't fire. I waited a moment longer, and it didn't fire. And I turned around to look, and the gun barrel was going like this. And I watched him, and he turned around, and the great big tears were running down his cheeks. He threw the gun over the ground, and he said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Amen. He grabbed me around the trouser leg. He said, I want you to pray for me and lead me to that Jesus that you're talking about. Amen. What was the matter? What was it? He had saw something real. He saw something that wasn't put on. He saw something that was genuine. He was satisfied. Man. That's what you want to know. Something real. Something not a farm put on. But a real God. Real love. Real action. Is that what your heart hungers for? Let's bow our heads in soft peace. I wonder now, with our heads bowed just a moment, think just a moment, how many of you here tonight, I'll be honest, how many of you would like to be the same kind of a Christian in your heart? As much Christian as that deer was a mama. Just raise your hand. Say, I'd like to be that kind of a Christian. God bless you. Something that would drive me right into the jaws of death and my love for Christ would move right on. Undying love. I love Him with all that's in me. He sees your hands. Our Heavenly Father, truly a greater than Solomon this year, a greater than any of the prophets this year, the Holy Spirit this year, the gift of God to the world. And He... For hundreds and hundreds of years, he could not get his way into the church, but in this last day, he promised that he would have a church without spot or wrinkle. And we see him tonight moving. Now he come into us speaking with tongues. He came into us in joy. And now he keeps getting greater gifts. And he heals the sick. And now he's raised the dead. And here he is, the, the Word of God. He is the Word. The Word was made flesh. And now the Word of God is a sharper than a two-edged sword. It's even a going to the sunder of the bone and the mire and a deserter of the thoughts of the heart. The Holy Spirit. And tonight, this little story about Bert and I up there, Father, just live like the world, and the world can't see no difference in them than the rest of the run of the world. You're able to take an old mother dear and bring one of your children to his senses. Thank you for it, Lord. And I pray tonight that the Holy Spirit will just fill every heart with love and peace. And let us see the hand of our God far truly a greater than Solomon this year. And now you promised in the last days that you would do this as it was in the days of Noah and as the days of Sodom. And then you dealt with the Jews and the Samaritans in that day. The Gentiles has had 2,000 years of training. And now at the end time, you couldn't be just, Lord. And then let the Jews just had to see that sign and had to turn it down. And then they were turned down. Now, Father, if you gave that to them and let the Gentiles go in just on theology alone, you're not that kind of a father. You're the same. You give one of your children the same as the other. You love them all. And each generation, each dispensation receives its sign and gift through the age. And now, Father, we know that we're thankful tonight to have the sign of the Holy Spirit, the resurrected Jesus, getting His church ready. Bless us tonight. Give us of Thy presence. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, with our hearts to Him, and I'm sorry to have kept this long. I'm really a half hour late. I told Billy I'll be gone by 9.30. And so the brethren can baptize and so forth. We got to crawl out in the morning about 3 o'clock. Now, that makes me, to think that, it makes me nervous, and that's the reason I chop up my message, what can do, you forgive me for that. But I trust that the Holy Spirit has said something in your heart that will make you believe. That's right, make you believe with all your heart. Now, we could call, I think we've got a few prayer cards out. We could call those prayer cards up here and pray for them, or we can do any way we want to close out the meeting. Or would you just rather to give everybody the equal a, a chance? Let's just pray then and ask the Heavenly Father and anyone out there that's got faith enough to touch you. Amen. Would you like to do that? Will you believe you got faith enough to do that? Raise your hand. Here we are. 
<laughs> That's right. You see, friends, where I'm sticking myself? <laughs> sticking myself out here. Here it is. There's people. I don't know them. But now I'm saying here that that God knows them. And I, when they come to see the wisdom of Solomon, and then when they come to see the working of Jesus, now remember, God cannot change. He's God always. What God ever makes, that's my faith in the Bible, if God ever makes a decision on anything, it has to ever remain that way. It can never change. Because He can't have uh, today, every one of His decisions are perfect because He's infinite. You know what infinite means? You know when you take your camera and put an in infinite? That just means from man on. Well, God is infinite. See, that's where the word infinite comes. Now, He... He never did start, so He never does end. And anything that ever started, ends. Amen. So that's the reason we have to be born of the Spirit of God, to have God's life in us, have eternal life, which the Greek word Zoe means God's own life in us, and that life can no more die than God can, because it's a part of God. The infinite. Amen. And that's His Spirit. Now, if His Spirit worked upon Solomon's age, it worked in the age of the Lord Jesus and promised it here in the last days. It's the same God. Amen. Amen. He promised it. You believe that? Amen. You believe it, my brethren? Amen. That's good. I wish I could take all of you with me in these meetings. Such good backing up as that. God will just do anything when He got plenty around you. That's right. You all be sure if we come back this fall, come on over, every one of you. See him. Let's have some fellowship again. Have several nights of meeting. Tell them pray for me. Now, here I am standing here. How many people in this audience... I recognize, if I'm not sure this is Sister Bryant, and these three people sitting right here, I know. Now, outside of that, I don't see anyone that I know, but this brother right here, and um, he come down, he's a Baptist. He come down and kept talking about the uh, Holy Spirit and everything. He couldn't quit smoking. And he got on a couple of interviews, and one morning the Holy Spirit moved right down, and that was the end of it. <laughs> he said, I'm, I live up in Carolina. I, don't, I said, you find Brother Bigby. Join his church. I said, because that's the place to go. I said, because I, I know he's a real teacher. So, I'm a man of God. So now, I didn't know many other brothers, but I know Brother Bigby. And I know this other fine man. I met him here in the hall tonight, look up and down here. And we're we all God's children, that's all. Now, how many people in here that's sick that I do not know? And you want God to help you. And you know that I don't know nothing about you. Nothing about what's wrong with you or anything. You say, like I noticed here somewhere, it might have been at the other meeting, a woman come across the platform and said, Yes, I know you. I was in one of your other meetings one time four or five years ago. My, I just think of how many tens of thousands I've met since then. So you have no way of knowing them. Just passing across the platform or sitting out there in the audience. And how many is sick now? And you know what? I don't know what's wrong with you. Just raise up your hand. There <laughs> Well, it looks like almost solid, and God surely will help us now. Now, I want you to do this. I want you to quit thinking about we ministers, brothers, you're on the platform. Now, this is not back in some Ouija board, in some dark room, with the lights out, the devil's work. It's right out here in the broad open light, the presence of Jesus Christ in His church. His Holy Bible in here declaring it. This is the Urim. The Urim of Thundam. This is a breastplate. <laughs> That's the fortified breastplate of every believer. That's right. See? And the Urim of Thundam is that supernatural that went off of it, declaring it. And you believe with all your heart. Don't doubt now. I want you to really believe. And you pray. And say, Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful to you that you sent your Son, Christ Jesus. He died in my stead. We tell you he was wounded for our transgressions, for these stripes were healed. That's things that he did. He's sitting at the right hand of the majesty tonight to make intercessions upon my confession. I've just heard Brother Branham tell in the last couple of nights that the Word of God was sharper than a two-edged sword, and it was a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. Now, when you were here on earth... You were the Word, made flesh and dwelt among us. We know that. You were the Word. And now we believe that the Word has come in the form of the Holy Spirit to vindicate the written Word. To make it right. Now, a woman touched your garment one time. And, and your son, Jesus Christ, turned around and picked the woman out 
and told her her blood issue. A blind man stopped him and so forth and on and on and on as we go through the scriptures. And now we see that you said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Now that's what he said. Is that right, brother? Amen. We want to believe that. Now let's all believe it with all of our heart. And all of you pray for me. Now each one of you just pull your unbelief out, put it on your feet, and curse it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And take the word of God and hold it up there and say, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm going to believe it with all my heart. I don't say that he will. If he doesn't, I, I can't make him do it. You know, he's just, he's God. I, I just, I just believe it. And now, if he doesn't do it, then, um, then we'll, I think there's a few prayer cards out in the building, maybe here tonight. And if they are, well, we'll call them up and bring the minister brothers here and pray for them. But I think... The main thing for a Christian, look at that Roman that time. The Jew said, come lay your hands on my daughter and she'll get well. The Roman said, I believe better than that. You just say the word. So Jesus turned around and said, I haven't seen faith like that amongst Israel. See? That's us Gentiles. We're supposed to know what his word says. It's the truth. Amen. That's the only reason I stand here like this tonight, because the word has promised it. You know that. And we have been looking for our years. For a great something to rise in the last days. You know, we're promised that that would bring the faith of the children back to the original Pentecostal fathers. That's right. We're looking for it. We promised it. And we believe it. Now just pray. And I'll pray with you. And we believe that maybe God will help us. And I hope that He does. I see it's right over a woman sitting here. She's looking at me, but she's sitting right here. She's crying. She's got her hand up like this, up to her face. She's got a patch on her face. That could be a stick that hit it. It could be anything. You believe God can tell me what it is from here? Would you accept it? It's cancer. You believe that God will make it well? Will you accept it? All right, sir. Then you can do it. Amen. The little lady sitting there with a dark sweater on. Put her hand down. Had her finger up to her mouth. You had your hand up a few minutes ago that she was here wanting prayer. Do you believe that God can reveal to me what your trouble is? You do? And if you'll believe it with all your heart, then your heart won't bother you anymore. And you'll be well. You believe that your heart troubles go beyond? All right, sir. Just the only thing you have to do is believe. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know those people. They're strangers. Now, do you believe me? Amen. Here's my hands up, my Bible here. I'm, as far as I know, I've never seen them in my life. They're just people that's sitting there. Here. Oh, what a feeling. <laughs> Praise God. Brother, the Holy Spirit. Look, I pray you try to see this. Look right there beside that woman. Look at that light right there. See, I kind of a milling soft glow light coming right down on her. Did you see it? Look. Just this lady sitting right there. She's praying for a son. Trouble with the mind. That's right, isn't it, lady? Raise your hand up if that's the truth. Just have faith. That struck the lady next to you. There it moved right from that lady over to the next one. You all got a prayer card? You have a prayer card? No, you don't. All right, you don't need one. The lady next to you there. A light right over by her. Just look this way towards me, sister, just a moment. You believe me to be his servant? Yes. It's your daughter. Just had an operation. You're praying about it. That's right. Raise up your hand. All right? Don't doubt. You'll get all right. You believe? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What you crying for, lady? You're all tore up, aren't you? You believe me to be his prophet? I'm a stranger to you. Don't cry. Hey, lip lady. Don't you do it. Don't do it. Now, I won't say it, but you're trying to fix it on to do something and don't you do it. It ain't worth it. Right. Leave it alone. Don't you do it. Keep away from it. Just get away, ignore it, it'll come out all right. Don't never take a life, because it won't work. 
stay away from it. You believe that I'm his servant? You don't live here, you're going to Charlotte now. That's right, Miss Mongo, you go back, don't do nothing about it, and God will be with you and work it out all right. You believe? Just have faith. Don't doubt. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. Way back. Way back, right at the back. Or for that man stand with a white shirt on, a woman with a skin trouble. You believe that God will make you well, lady? You accept it? Believe it? That's right. All right, there she is. Just stand up on your feet so you can just praise God for it. And that will lead you. You have a prayer card? You don't need one. When you got faith like that, you don't need a prayer card. That's going to leave you because the shadow that was standing right there over you has left. Here's a lady sitting right down this way. She's, uh, God may she not. She's had trouble. She's had a wreck. And she's, uh,. It's uh, causing her to get weak spells. Kind of a blackout like. She's not from here, from Georgia. Just believe Miss Griffin, <laughs> and you'll get well. I'm a stranger to her. I don't know her. Stand up, lady. Recognize the Lord Jesus as your healer. Do you believe, my friends? Lady sitting right back here praying. She's praying for a friend that's an alcoholic. Another with tumor on the brain. Say, you was in one of my meetings one time. You were healed with a cancer. That's right. You live in Charleston. It's real and go home now. Jesus Christ gives you your desire. Amen. You believe? Amen. With all your heart? Amen. I believe the Holy Spirit has crossed the entire building. Are you believers? How many in here believes that a greater than Solomon is here? How many believes that he said this, if they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover? Do you believe that? And you said you were believers? Now let's put our hands on one another. Our Heavenly Father, we are bringing this audience to you. We've been speaking of the great gifts down through the ages. And here we are, bound in heart by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here with us, uh, manifesting Himself, showing that, that the church is receiving its Last sign, Amen. just before God turns and takes the church into glory. Now let these believers, may the Holy Spirit look down on the hearts of those believers that's got their hands on someone else praying for them. You said the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise them up. You said these signs will follow the believers. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And we've been taught through the years that wherever two were gathered together or three, you would be in the midst of them. And here you are tonight, Lord, just as real as you was when you come with the opus and them and broke the bread and they recognize you. By a sign that you did before your crucifixion, they know you'd raised from the dead. And they went to their places, light-hearted, rejoicing, and saying, Truly the Lord has risen. 
Now, Lord God, I pray that you will go with us, Lord. May the power of the Holy Spirit free every person that's in here tonight. That's now with any affliction. As I'm joining hands with this ministerial group here, as your servants, believing for this audience. And we are not poor in one place. And the Holy Ghost is here to heal the sick and the afflicted. Oh, God, may the power of the devil be broken. And the Holy Spirit be all of this audience. And cast away the evil spirit of unbelief. In the name of Jesus Christ. I believe him. I believe that every one of you is healed if you just accept it. We minister show the platform of join hands together with one unit of prayer. We believe with all our heart in this Christ that's manifesting himself here before us. What is it? It's the year of thunder being made manifest to the world. The Holy Spirit and the last day sign before the earth is bare. Oh, hide yourself in Christ tonight in His promise and be made whole, every one of you. All that we'll believe it. Stand up to our feet now as we raise our hands to Him with one accord. That's right. That's right. My faith looks up to me. 